What do people working remote IT actually do? Welcome back to another day in my life. My name is Jake. I'm a system administrator at an MSP. An MSP is a managed service provider. So we provide IT services to a bunch of other companies. Today was a rather average day. We get exposed to a lot of different technologies. It's one of my favorite parts of my job. I'm going to go through every ticket that I touched today. It can certainly be stressful at times, but again, today was average and I liked it. So let's get into it. So the first ticket that I had was an SSL cert. If you've seen one of my previous videos, you've probably noticed that I do a lot of these SSL certs. SSL is Secure Sockets Layer. It's very important for keeping the internet up and running. It uses something called PKI, Public Key Infrastructure, to verify trust between a client and a server. So if you're doing anything over the internet and you click on your browser up at the top left, there's probably a lock icon and you can view the certificate. Those certificates need to be managed by someone, whether it's a web host, their MSP, somebody else. SSL makes the world work. So for this cert, I was just verifying let's say that their domain was domain.com. I was verifying whether we or somebody else actually manages this cert because I had an auto-populated ticket that it needed to be renewed. I'm currently waiting on an internal contact to get back to me on that one. After this, I had a really interesting ticket where I got to look over a USB drive policy GPO. GPO is group policy object. Group policy is how you manage things at an organizational level for an org. So in this case, I work in a heavily regulated industry. We have to do everything up to par and we have to ensure that users can't plug USBs and use removable media on their PCs. This is to prevent things like data loss prevention, like you can download customer sensitive information onto a USB and then put it wherever you want it. So I had to do two things for this ticket. Firstly, I had to ensure that the people on the list that were allowed the USBs, like a CEO and a couple of other people, were actually the people that we wanted. There was nobody else on that list. And then secondly, I had to ensure that the USB policy was actually applying correctly, looking at a reg key and ensuring that it has the right D word value. So in terms of the policy applying correctly, the process that we had was kind of outdated and we had to use this old program that we have to try and check it and it was super cumbersome and I was like I don't feel like doing this anymore so I went with ChatGPT and I put together a script to actually check the specific registry keys and ensure that they're actually applying the way we want them to apply after this I realized that the GPO itself was made really ugly there were multiple different GPOs and it was super messy and not built out the way that it should be I should say the cleanest way that it could possibly be so I cleaned this up as well we have an allow removable media group and we add people to that group and then we have a deny removable media GPO. So the removable media is denied by default for everyone. This is called an implicit deny. It's something that you're gonna learn about in Security Plus. It's something that you'll learn about with CCNA, with ACLs. It's a very important concept. This way, anytime a new user is created, we don't have to add them to any group or anything like that. They can't use removable media. However, if we add someone to this group, they can use removable media. So I cleaned everything up in this GPO. There was actually two separate ones and I made it into one GPO, made it nice and clean, updated the primary engineer and then updated our documentation on this process for how to check that the registry key is correct, check the list of people is correct, and also just updating him that I had made those changes. When you've been in IT long enough, you see things over and over again, you start to understand the best way to do things, the cleanest way to do things, and you want things to be nice and manageable and clean for future issues so you can save work in the future and become more efficient, if that makes sense. So that was maybe an hour. After this, I had a cool ticket where I was tracking down a mystery device. They had an idea that it was probably a router. They they had an IP address for it and they had a MAC address for it. And basically I was tasked with tracking it down and figuring out, hey, what does this device do? So the first thing I did is I knew that it was at a certain location. I hopped into their switch, their 9200L, and I ran show MAC address. Show MAC address table is gonna show me all of the MAC addresses for devices that are connected to that switch because switches work at layer two. They collect MAC addresses and save them in a table. This also shows you what interface these devices are on. So I found the interface that the device was on, but that didn't really help me that much. I already knew the IP and the MAC address. After this, I ran show CD neighbors. CDP is Cisco discovery protocol. And if neighbors are Cisco devices or devices that run this protocol, they're going to show up and they're going to have a bunch of details about what they actually are. This helped a lot showing me that it was a router and it was, it had ISR. So it was a Cisco ISR router. Uh, it shows the name and I at least knew kind of what kind of device was on this switch port. So that helped me a little bit. I got with internal, got her to go into the switch closet actually, because I work remote. She goes into the switch closet, takes a picture of the device. It is indeed a big router. I discussed with the count team, they think that it's probably an old router from one of their old core softwares that's just still plugged in. So then I run show run int G101 in order to see that interface and see how many packets are going across this switch port interface. And the traffic that I was seeing was very little. There was not much going across this interface. So I was pretty confident to be able to say, hey, this is that old router that we think it is. And I don't think it's in use anymore. Then I scheduled a time with internal where I'm going to administratively disable that switch port, make a description that says, hey, this is an old router, and then save that configuration 
situation and we'll all make sure that nothing breaks and go on with our lives. Eventually we'll unplug the router and just take it off the network whenever we get someone to go on premises. I love those type of networking tickets. Those are my favorite kind of tickets where you get to hop in, do some investigation, run some show commands, really use the things that I learned in the CCNA. It makes me feel super useful and it's kind of fun. And you don't really have to talk to anyone either. That's also cool. After this, I had two more of those SSL cert tickets. I won't go into detail about those two, but it was much of the same. After this, I had a tier three, a system engineer reach out to me and he needed some help with DNS filtering. He's a good friend of mine and he knows that I've done a ton of DNS filtering and I really understand our solution well. So I took him through the situation, how we can gather data, how we can ensure that uh, the device has a good deployment of the agent that we use for DNS proxying and DNS filtering. We gathered some data using something called activity search where we can see requests going through for individual identities and see why certain things are getting blocked and why things aren't getting blocked. And basically I just gave him a bunch of context for him to run with. So now he has a ton of information. He can continue troubleshooting his problem. After this, I had a company that I had to give GoDaddy access. GoDaddy is a public DNS host. So if you have a website, for example, jakehulberg.dev, you might host it in GoDaddy. I don't, but you might. In this website, you're going to access things like SSL certs, like domain management, A records, text records, C name records, things like that, that again, you're going to learn about in Network Plus, CCNA, Security Plus, all important concepts. Basically, as a managed service provider, if we want to manage DNS for somebody else, we're going to manage it under a distribution list using something called delegate access. So the internal content can delegate access to that DNS host to us so that we can hop into their DNS and manage things as we have to. We do this through a distribution list because then everybody on that list gets a copy of things like MFA codes and stuff like that. So it's easy to do MFA with the distribution list and it's easy for anyone to be able to manage it. It doesn't go to any specific email address. We just add our individual email addresses to the distribution list then we all get a code. So I was setting that up. After this, ticket number eight, I had another GPO ticket where I was setting up GPO for icons to appear on everybody's desktop. Really simple GPO. I used ChatGPT for the actual configuration path. Kind of tested a little bit and realized that I had put a couple of users, but testing with those users, the icons were not appearing on their desktops. I realized why, because this GPO filters for users, but I did not give their computers read access to the GPO. In order for a GPO to apply to someone, their computer has to be able to read the GPO as well. I just put the user identities in there. So we troubleshot this a little bit, and then we got the computer's read access, and then we ran GP update slash force, and we saw that they were indeed getting those icons. Good to send it out to everybody. After this, I had a tier one reach out to me regarding an ESX host. So we had a chat because it had popped up on our radar and I think we didn't really know what it was and we didn't know if we had credentials for it. We tried tracking it down, tried hitting its IP in the browser, tried looking through our documentation, seeing if we had these credentials, seeing if this thing was even really still a thing because we weren't able to hit it in the browser and we just had no luck. Now for context, an ESX host is a physical box. It's a physical server running VMware's ESXi hypervisor. This is the box or server that's going to hold multiple virtual machines. So like your domain controller, your file server, your app server, your print server is all going to be virtual machines on this physical ESX host. Now, if you can't get into it, it could affect a bunch of systems. Of course, if it exists, if it goes down, you lose all of those servers. So they're very redundant, very secure machines that are used for virtualization. And virtualization is big. If you want to work in IT, you have to learn about it. Since we couldn't track it down, we were kind of questioning whether this thing was even still on the network. We have a lot of companies that we migrate their servers to our data center. Sometimes they put them in Azure and we just don't get updated. So we don't really know where the servers are. In this case, what this ESX host was. We're waiting on the primary engineer for some more direction on this ticket. After this, I had a colleague who needed BitLocker keys. If your Windows device crashes, sometimes it'll call for a BitLocker key. If it's an encrypted drive, you need to have this key stored somewhere so you can grab it, put it in and actually get this thing unencrypted and get back in. This is usually when it has some big crash, some BIOS level crash, you know, a TPM issues or something like that. I helped him get the BitLocker keys. Fortunately, I knew where they were stored. We got those keys, got them in, and I gave him some troubleshooting steps to ensure that the drive is healthy, that everything is healthy, running things like SFC, DISM, and then checking Event Viewer to see why the thing crashed in the first place. After this, I had a colleague reach out because she needed to rename a computer. And all of these people reaching out to me are usually tier ones who just need some help, need some assurance, or just kind of have a question on stuff. So a lot of my day is helping a ton of different people, as you see. But she needed help renaming a computer. I explained to her the process to do it. I basically just explained to her, yeah, just go ahead and rename it in the computer itself. Do not go into Active Directory and rename a computer arbitrarily. If you do that, it's going to break trust between the computer and the domain, and you're going to have issues. She got it done. Good to go. After this, I had an interesting ticket where a fellow sysadmin was working on a GPO to remove Microsoft Copilot. This was insanely difficult. We had to manually set registry keys to remove Copilot from all of the Windows integration that Microsoft has with it now. That seemed to work out just fine, but we also needed to remove the Copilot app. I was not able to figure out a way to remove this app. We found some 
scripts, going through Reddit, remove app X package type stuff. And it was just being so pesky. Like we could not get the thing to go away. I finally figured out how to get it to go away by comparing it to another company that I had and found that the remove app X package script that we were running was like being blocked by script execution or something of that sort. So we worked on this for like two hours, long story short. We're downloading admin templates, getting them into the sysvol in order for things to work for this GPO. We could not figure out why it wasn't working. We're scouring Reddit. Basically, Microsoft is just being super pesky about this one. I think we're to a point where we kind of have it working. I was at least able to remove it from my company. We're still in the testing phase and we're going to go through with that next week. After this, I had a tier one reach out for some more DNS filtering stuff. I explained how client side DNS works. And then we realized that this company has a very non-standard setup. They have their kind of their own internal DNS solution and they have an internal help desk team as well. So we ended up just pushing that ticket onto the internal help desk team and they're taking care of it. Lastly, I had a coworker reach out because he has to update some SFTP software. SFTP is secure file transfer protocol. We have SFTP servers that are usually not on the domain. They're completely separate in something called a DMZ. And they're going to host this SFTP software where people can drop files, pick up files. There's a bunch of transfers going on all the time. It's super delicate. I had a case where I was trying to update the software for one of my companies after hours. I worked for like two hours, got a bunch of errors, got a bunch of logs. And then I just had to revert the server back to a snapshot from two hours prior. Because when we're doing updates on a server, we always want to take a snapshot so that if we mess something up, we can always just revert back to it. And it kind of like restores that server to a previous point. So long story short, I had a ton of issues with my update. And I was just explaining these issues to my colleague who has to do the same update on the same software for one of his companies. We're at a point where he hasn't updated yet. I just told him everything that went wrong. I started a case with the vendor and I'm still waiting to hear back from them. I'm not looking forward to trying that again. So that's that. That was 15 tickets, but a couple of them were pretty heavy. Like those GPO ones, the co-pilot one, the switch one was really cool, but it was kind of heavy. And they took a lot of my time during today. I also didn't have a million people reaching out to me. So that was super nice as well. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. This is a real day in the life thing that I'm actually doing. If you don't understand some of the acronyms that you've heard in this video, I highly recommend that you go look them up and try learning about them because this is what real life IT is actually like. I make these videos because I would have wanted to see this type of thing before I got into IT. Please note as well, I am a system administrator. I'm not a tier one. So the stuff that I'm doing is also a little bit more complicated than you're going to be doing at tier one help desk. But I want to share the real raw reality. Appreciate you guys. Be safe, be smart, make some good decisions and good luck with those tickets.